Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center uh, Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Pox, Populism, and Politics, Three Centuries of American Vaccination Controversies. I'm joined by Robert Johnston. He's a professor of history and director of the Teaching of History program at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Today is October the 12th. My name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center, and I want to welcome all of you uh, to tonight's episode on behalf of my team, Jira, Mike, and Meredith. Uh, all of us have education backgrounds. We have educators' worldviews, and we're very pleased that uh, our weekly and our regular uh, activities and events are helpful and relevant to you, both in terms of your own expansion of the learning of what you know of these topics, but also in completing your professional portfolio. In particular, tonight, I want to throw some uh, some welcome and some shout outs to some of our high school folks tonight. It's always great to see Wendy. Wendy's joining us from St. Paul uh, and uh, is a good colleague and friend. Lucy's here from North Henderson High School, Candace from Crossland High School, and Michelle from Whitesboro High School, scattered across the country in different places. Always great to have Christopher, you with us tonight as well at Verduga Hills High School and all the rest of uh, our participants tonight. The National Humanity Center is located in Durham, North Carolina. And we're struggling with exactly the same kinds of questions and responses that many of you shared in the chat box. Uh, I, I added as our opening slide the uh, primary source of the very first required school vaccination. Judy Freeman, I wonder if that's at your school since Boston Latin was the first public school in the country. Um, but you know the, the kinds of questions and the kinds of responses that you as a district, as teachers, as individuals, as parents likely, uh, are facing is exactly the kinds of questions that we have at the center. Um, we've actually uh, reopened for the first time um, since last year, uh, this past August. We welcomed our fellowship class, which in some ways is a little bit like like your cohort of students who come in. Um, we have kept a pretty strict health protocol in terms of wearing a mask in the building, of going through a temperature check before you enter, and uh, also reducing the number of people who could be in a particular uh, confined space. But it does affect community. It affects uh, being able to speak with each other in the hallways or at lunch. It affects uh, all those ways that we communicate with each other uh, that, that are not verbal. Um, and you know, while, it's, while we're getting close to returning, uh, it's definitely still affecting us and still something that we take very seriously. I suspect that all of you as educators are consistently and regularly, daily even, um, explaining or contextualizing or trying to make some sense of, of this overall policy perspective, then I'm hopeful that tonight's session will give you some more understanding, some more knowledge that helps you in that conversation. Of course, all the materials that we're sharing with you tonight and in uh, all other National Humanities Center activities are located in the digital library. I would encourage you to sign up for the webinar series group. This is where you'll find all the readings associated with tonight's session. You'll also find the recordings there uh, once we post them afterwards and the PowerPoint. And you can go here and find all the materials uh, for all of our webinars in one central place. And again, these are free and open, and we hope you find them valuable in your instructional design. If you've got an interest in, uh, in teaching the medical humanities or health humanities, or, or maybe even having a more in-depth conversation around the pandemic and this, this new um, uh, pandemic world that we're living in, that I'd encourage you to look for both past and future webinars that we have scheduled. Uh, for example, uh, in the last several years, we have hosted webinars, one with Mary Weeble, who's at uh, University of Pittsburgh, the second with Nina Jankowicz, who is at the Woodrow Wilson Center, around, around this kind of role of the, of the individual in the pandemic world. We've also got two sessions coming up that um, may get closer to this. Uh, Elizabeth Altka from University of Richmond will be joining us uh, to share um, some different literature selections that can be viewed through a pandemic lens. And then we'll be working with Nad Enstein from uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, which is not on the pandemic necessarily, but it kind of is. It's the role of the early cigarette industry in the ways that capitalism often trumps health policy or the ways in which we approach the health of our citizenry and ourselves. I'd encourage you to sign up for all these. We would love to see you uh, join us for any of those. I also want to note, by the way, that we do have one program note uh, an upcoming webinar, this one called Decolonizing the Shakespeare Curriculum with Ianna Thompson has been rescheduled from November 4th to November 30th. So if you signed up for that, or if you're interested in signing up, please note that the date has shifted and changed. 
As I always do, I want to make sure to recognize and thank our Teacher Advisory Council for their continued uh, dedication and contributions to our work. These 21 educators uh, are really um, very important connections that we have with the classroom and the needs of the teachers, both in terms of curriculum and in terms of your own educational practice. So uh, I want to thank them for all of their hard work. Finally, I want to note that um, while tonight's webinar is an audio and PowerPoint only webinar, your participation is actually very important and critical. Uh, continue to use the audience chat box just as you have been sharing ideas, uh, cracking jokes if your name is Ulysses, um, uh, offering different links and URLs. This is also a place, though, where you can ask formal questions. In the Ask the Professor tab, those questions will come directly to me as the moderator. I'll queue those up, and then I'll bring those to Professor Johnston when the time seems right. Um, if for any reason tonight your volume seems low, please do note that there is a volume button just beneath the photograph of the speaker, and you can toggle that and you can increase uh, the volume as needed. So again, you've joined the Humanities in Class webinar titled Pox, Populism and Politics, Three Centuries of American Vaccination Controversies. I'm pleased to be joined by lead scholar Robert Johnston from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Alongside us tonight is our TA for the webinar, that's Stacy Christensen. Stacy's joining us from Boise, Idaho. She's a member of this year's TAC, and she'll be dropping uh, links and questions in the chat box. She's also curated some instructional resources that are also in the webinar folder that you might find, uh, find valuable, and we hope that you can modify for your own needs. So uh, that's my introduction, uh, Professor. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, can you hear me, Professor Johnston? I can hear you, and thank you very much for inviting me. Fantastic. Well, before we get started and I turn the, um, the slideshow over to you, I'd, I'd like to ask you a personal question, if you don't mind. And it, it's one that requires a little bit of a long view, I think. Um, as I've noted in your, uh, in your introduction, as we can see from your title, you're the Director of Teaching of History program at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I suspect you've been teaching history for a while, long enough to perhaps answer this question. Hey, Professor, how has teaching history changed for you since you first entered the classroom? The world has changed. It's a very complicated place now. The digital age, the, the various uh, you know, sort of big things that we need to respond to. What, what's it like for you now compared to when you started? Yeah, well, thank you. That's a, a great question. I really appreciate the teaching angle because I'm hoping that we can address some of those kinds of issues as well as kind of the straight up history. So yeah, I've been teaching for 30 years, and if you were able to see me on video, you'd see my COVID hair kind of getting gray, um, but it's nice to be able to grow it down a little bit. And 30 years ago, when I did have even more hair, I think the basic idea was still that we were very much in uh, a mode of teaching of history where the experts, whether that was in colleges or in high school or middle schools, transmitted the facts to the students. And now there's a significant democratization, I would say, mm -hmm. in terms of how history gets taught, with a real invitation to students to actually do history. And that's incredibly mm -hmm. exciting. Do you get a sense at all that your students are, because of this access and their abilities to uh, question uh, things that we inspire, actually, and encourage as educators, but do you find that they're uh, more engaged? Do you find that they're cynical? Do you find that they're suspicious? How, do, how have your students uh, changed in the last three decades? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. There's certainly a very strong strain of skepticism slash cynicism, even, say, teaching in a, a, a very uh, blue place like Chicago. Uh, that cynicism and conspiracy thinking certainly transcends political ideologies, I think. That said, uh, I find there's a huge amount of hope right now. Uh, the people I teach, I have a lucky subset where I'm especially working with people who are going to be middle school and high school social studies teachers, and they want to do this because they're committed civic citizens, and it's really exciting to see. That's fantastic. Well, we're really looking forward to, uh, to your talk tonight, and again, we want this to be a conversation, so I'm going to encourage everybody in our audience to continue to drop questions and comments in the chat boxes. And as the moderator, I'll bring those to you uh, on an, with an occasional break. Again, thank you for being here. All right. Should I take it away? Yes. Go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, again, uh, thank you so very much uh, for joining us. 
today. I really do hope that we have a very significant discussion. I've become a little bit better about multitasking, and we'll try to kind of keep an eye on the audience chat, but I know I'm going to miss a lot of that, so I really appreciate that Andy will be there to curate and send uh, important questions and insights to me, but please do uh, challenge me. I try to present uh, not just a distinctive, but kind of controversial view of these kinds of issues, as I do in uh, much of the rest of my scholarly work, and so I really welcome pushback. So please uh, have at that. Uh, but first, I just wanted to say uh, greetings from Chicago. I'm a native Oregonian, so I felt like slipping in a picture of Mount Hood, but I have lived in Chicago longer than any other place in my life. And that big, tall, ugly building called Brutalist Architecture, otherwise known as University Hall on the left, is where I have my office on the ninth floor. And I uh, just want to give a shout out to the once great and perhaps future great Chicago Cubs. It's a sad day in Chicago baseball today because the White Sox, whom I was rooting for, uh, did get eliminated. But for those Cubs fans out there, I did want to say thanks in particular and greetings. Uh, so look, it's impossible, and I don't use that word very often, but it is impossible to think about these issues of history related to such a hot, hot, hot button issue without thinking about our current context. And of course, there are many ways of thinking about that current context, but one is that there is, to many people's minds, an incredibly surprising extent of vaccine resistance, anti-vaccinationism, uh, as some people will call it, vaccine refusal, vaccine hesitancy. I think there's a wide spectrum, excuse me, spectrum of a different kinds of concerns about mainstream vaccination policies and practices. And they're completely connected to uh, our current political environment, much of which is toxic and polarized and dangerous. And so I certainly have my own views. I think you'll get a decent sense of those as well. I am trying to do very responsible, fact-based, uh, discipline-based, source-based history, and at the same time also arguing very strongly that the way we think about history or about the present is a good thing in terms of thinking about the past, that we want to create a responsible connection between the past and the present. And therefore, we need to embrace the fact that right now, arguably one of the most important images of anti-vaccination activity now even relates to the people involved in the January 6th fascist coup. This perspective, or the perspective that's most mainstream on people who have been anti-vaccinationists or vaccine hesitant throughout history, is actually one that goes back decades and not really uh, to the very beginning of all kind of show, which is, to my mind, in America 300 years ago. The idea being that those who oppose immunization practices, as articulated by public health authorities, are dangerous, deluded, ignorant, stupid, dumb, all the kinds of names that you'd want to throw at them. Scholars use more responsible language generally, but not always, that in terms of trying to figure out why there has been such massive resistance to vaccination throughout the American past, usually it's a single factor of ignorance. Same kind of thing today in terms of disinformation. I am very skeptical of that. It's certainly a part of the story, but we need to move beyond that in order to figure out what complexities we can best learn from. I do want, however, to kind of make sure that you have some sources for what the conversation about vaccine or anti-vaccination history is before we move on to talking about certain episodes related to it. You may very well have heard of Paul Offit, who is one of the most important, arguably the most important uh, proponent of vaccinations in this country outside of Anthony Fauci. And before Fauci came back into the picture, arguably was the most important person. He's published a wide number of books. He has a prestigious chair at the University of Pennsylvania. He's involved both as a clinician and even a vaccine manufacturer himself, as well as a historian, a popular historian, but one who is, in fact, a very responsible and discipline-based historian as well, even if I think a problematic uh, historian in very significant ways. 
His most important take on history comes from this 2011 book that's up on the screen, Deadly Choices, where, in fact, he very closely links the past and the present. He basically says, we've got this terrible problem at that point, say, with Jenny McCarthy uh, espousing the connection, be supposed the connection between vaccines and autism, and we could read that into the past. These dumb people in 2011 are exactly the same people as we see in the 19th, 20th century, and even back into the 18th century. And Offit is merciless in castigating these people. He says that uh, there is no mercy permitted to those who are killing people in this deadly war. And he brings that rhetoric to his take on history. So that's the traditional viewpoint that would argue that there's only one way of looking at vaccine controversies, and that is one that is deeply involved in condemning them as dangerous and ignorant. What I want to do is just talk a little bit then about a different way of thinking about these conflicts in a very general way before again talking about specific examples. And here I love this quotation from James Lowen, who recently passed, one of my very favorite philosophers, you might say, of the teaching of history. And I'll read it out, often I don't, and I won't necessarily read all the quotations in the slideshow, there aren't that many. But he says, historiography is the most single important gift that a history course can give to a student. I utterly love that. I love that because it's such a delicious challenge to our teaching because still so few people, but a growing number, do do historiography and also because it points to what is arguably the central most important way of doing history, which is teaching debate. In Lowen's words again, furious debate informed by reason and evidence. That's from Lies My Teacher Told Me. And so for us to get a sense of how we should think about the, any issue in history, but certainly vaccine controversies, we need to not just know the facts, we need to know something about the way scholars and non-scholars have conceptualized our history. So I want to give you three books that I really highly recommend as avatars of the new historiography of vaccination controversies. Again, if you followed these things, Michael Woolrich has been quoted quite a lot recently in terms of what's going on now with COVID because his book Pox and American History is an utterly superb narrative treatment that relates to the smallpox outbreak of the late, very late 19th century and early 20th century. And Wilrich, like all the other historians whom I mentioned, are avowedly and self-professedly pro-vaccine. They make that very clear. At the same time, what Wilrich tries to do is show that there are indeed two sides, or in fact, more than two sides to these conflicts that if you look at what was going on with the mass uh, vaccination of Americans during the late 19th, and early 20th century, you could see medical progress, you can see the saving of lives, and at the same time, you can also see often deadly conflicts that were utterly infused with racial hierarchy, racial violence, class hierarchy, class violence, where elites use vaccination in order to control blacks, immigrants, Mexicans on the border, and the like. And in turn, there was significant resistance from working class and other disempowered populations. It's a really wonderful tale, and I urge you to take a look at it if you want, or even better, you can just look online, and he's written a few essays that are quite accessible in, say, Salon. The other part of what's really distinctive about Wilrich besides his narrative skills is that he also has a very strong argument that anti-vaccination movements were critical to the development of American liberty in ways that most of us would approve. If we approve of freedom of speech, Wilrich argues that anti-vaccinationists were some of the primary people in the early 20th century pushing for a genuine freedom of the press. And especially if you are arguing that bodily autonomy of all sorts, whether reproductive or otherwise, is an important 
uh, cultural practice and political policy, then Rorich makes the very striking argument that anti-vaccination has articulated a language and a set of ideas related to bodily autonomy that get us directly to uh, first Griswold versus Connecticut and the ability of married couples to use birth control, which in turn led directly to Roe v. Wade and other Supreme Court decisions that of course threatened related to bodily autonomy. So anti-vaccinationists were in this way pioneers of American liberalism, a very challenging argument. Elena Konas, in turn, takes us primarily to the 1960s and the 1970s and her wonderful Vaccine Nation, great title, is about the development of government policy during the Kennedy era, the Great Society, and on into the 90s related to vaccine policy. And it's also more than that. It talks about the grassroots in very intriguing and important ways. And especially what CODIS would ask us to think about is how deeply people who were not just anti-vaccine, some of these people would have in fact said, no, I don't have problems with vaccines in general, but I'm concerned about certain uh, consequences, both political and medical related to them, were intimately connected to feminism and environmentalism. And that we, and that vaccine politics was a critical way in which feminism and environmentalism came into being in that time period, especially during the 1970s. So again, another wonderful read. And finally, the most challenging of the books is Karen Wallach. I should say, Wilrich teaches at Brandeis, Konis teaches at Berkeley, and uh, Wallach teaches at Wisconsin-Madison. And this is the most challenging of the books. It's the one that is closest to arguing that, in fact, not only were smallpox vaccines in the early 20th century dangerous, and I'll be exploring that issue as well a little bit later on, because they were, but also that they represented a genuine threat to American liberties. And she primarily uh, uses that narrative, or excuse me, that analysis to write a narrative of Henning Jacobson, somebody who shows up in the uh, podcast that I recommend in the recommended readings I've passed along. Jacobson versus Massachusetts, the 1905 Supreme Court decision, uh, is the foundational Supreme Court doctrine related to public health. It does carve out certain realms of bodily autonomy, but it's sanctioned and approved of compulsory vaccination. And what Wallach, and usually that tale is told from the Supreme Court angle, what Wallach does is get us to the local level, to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Henning Jacobson, a Swedish immigrant pastor to a working class community, was trying to protect his family as well as his working class congregants from what he perceived as a dangerous overreach of police power and dangerous medicine. It's an intriguing book. I, I think it's very compelling, but if you really want to throw something challenging at you, uh, I would recommend Wallach's book very highly. So here I really want to round out my introduction and then take some time for any questions. And that is that insofar as we need to move in a direction intellectually and generally of looking at the history of vaccine controversies, we need to recognize that they weren't all the same, that there was a wide diversity to them at any given time and across the centuries. We need to recognize that there was a complexity to them, a combination of, say, democracy and anti-democracy, which is another one of my themes here at the end, that you cannot understand American democracy historically without understanding vaccine conflicts. We need to be very careful about presentism. And we all know that from teaching history, that we can't just think about the past in our own supposedly very enlightened ways. At the same time, we do need to use the past to make a meaningful present possible. What we can't do, however, is simply condemn people who don't seem to fit our current ways of approval. 
So, for example, and I am, I'm very uh, much approving of the, not just the COVID-19 vaccines, but also their mass implementation. But that doesn't mean that because people were opposed or hesitant about vaccines in the past, the condemnation is an intellectually respectable way of approaching that history. And finally, for reasons I'll be getting into in a little bit, I think that many vaccine controversies were highly related to populism and that we can actually stretch that concept of populism, which usually, say, relates to the late 19th century farmers' movement, to the populace, to look at a wide variety of anti-elitist movements that challenged the authorities at the time and, in fact, go back 300 years. So, Andy, let me take a little break here and see what you got. Well, Professor, we don't have any formal questions yet, but I, I would like to ask you to, to clarify or maybe to expand just a little bit on, on something that you shared, um, and that is the uh, this notion of um, of the importance of historiographies as a history teacher. And I suspect because of what you've done tonight and uh, the, the way that you probably teach yourself, do you regularly provide um, reading lists and historiography, some kind of overview to your students in your classes? Yeah, absolutely I do. I mean, historiography is something complicated enough that you need to provide some foundation for your students to get going. And at the same time, depending on your resources, which of course can significantly vary, but I think in, again, this fairly all-encompassing electronic environment, there is decent access to historiography, even just on Google. And so I ask the students to continue to explore on their own helping them, of course. Uh, and so it's not just that I'm giving it to them, but that they're finding out themselves what kind of scholarship is out there. Great. Well, why don't we go ahead and move forward? And then uh, again, I'll be queuing questions up to each of your section and we'll take a pause in a moment. Very good, thank you. All right, so I'm actually working on a book now about the entire period from 1721. I'll explain that date in a moment. To the present. So it's a very difficult task to try to fit all that in, and I certainly wouldn't be able to do it in a short lecture of this sort. So I wanted to focus on what I think are three of the most important eras in relation to vaccine controversies in the United States, or even before the United States. And that is the Boston inoculation conflict, which occurred exactly 300 years ago. The Progressive Era, which has all sorts of different dates related to this different delightful historiographical controversies. But for my purposes, I'm going to bring, start the Progressive Era in the 1890s, bring it to the 1920s, and then uh, the early Cold War period, where vaccine controversies, I think, significantly transformed from their earlier, I think, relatively democratic, small d character to a more threatening and menacing uh, presentation. All right, so I hope there are some folks out there from Boston. These are some classic images. My older son lives in Boston in Jamaica Plain, so I have a chance to visit and, and love the city and its rich history. And what happened in Boston in 1721 going on into 1722 is the foundation point for considering controversies about immunization. And here I just want to say why I'm using the words immunization, vaccination, and inoculation kind of collectively. But what happened in 1721 was that there was a great conflict about inoculation, meaning the introduction of actual smallpox material harvested usually from somebody's wounded arm with a great smallpox uh, pustule, and inserted by means of surgical incision into someone else's arm. You can get a very instructive and very graphic, very cringeworthy uh, sense of this if you just Google uh, John Adams HBO inoculation, and there is uh, quite a uh, scene of Abigail Adams and her children being inoculated. That's different from the vaccination that began through Edward Jenner in, the seven, in 1798, which 
had a different virus, a weaker virus, inserted into the arm in order to create an immunity. So the first inoculations in America, in, in fact, all of the Americas, occurred in Boston in 1721. And I'll talk about who introduced them and why in a moment. But for now, I'll just indicate that this represented the most important political controversy in the Northeast in the early 18th century because introduction, excuse me, inoculation was met with massive resistance. And as you can see from the Ben Franklin quote written in 1759, that this was a tradition that lasted through much of the 18th century. Franklin, Ben Franklin himself was involved in the earlier episode of 1721. His brother, James, whom we'll meet in a moment, uh, was the primary spokes or printer of the anti-inoculation uh, arguments, even though Franklin himself, uh, Ben Franklin, excuse me, later became a very avowed supporter of inoculation, especially after losing a child to smallpox. All right, so who are the characters? I think I've got four I'd like to introduce. Zabdiel Boylston was the physician who went around Boston, often at his own risk because people were wanting to attack him, to actually perform the inoculation. And he was very proud of his work, and Bostonians continue to be quite proud of him, as you'll see by the number of parks and streets and other uh, entities named after Boylston. The reason, however, that Boylston was doing what he was doing really came from Cotton Mather, the most distinguished, elite, and important Puritan minister of this period, of course, and one known to many of you, and I hope uh, somebody still taught these days, even though our conception of history has changed so much. Mather was, in fact, uh, somebody who was involved in just about everything going on in New England, including, most intimately, the witchcraft crises of the period. And he has a very bad reputation for that reason. And in fact, his one redeeming feature in many scholars' minds is that he had read about the practice of inoculation in Europe and other parts of the world. And he had, most importantly, learned about it from the person whom his congregation had given him as a gift uh, 15 years earlier, the enslaved man Onesimus, who told Mather about African inoculation practices. And using this knowledge, he waited to, for an epidemic to hit Boston and then made sure that there would be a very strong uh, commitment to inoculation because he knew that it would be life saving. And he figured that everybody would be more than happy to go along with it. The problem, however, was that he did not reckon with the kind of opposition that those in the city had already to him because he was a very loathsome figure because of his uh, ministry and his politics, but also in particular because people were very concerned that inoculation was a dangerous activity. And the result was a controversy that was so intense that Mather himself wrote, quote, the town has become almost a hell upon earth, a city full of lies and murders and blasphemies as far as wishes and speeches can render it so. Satan seems to take a strange possession of it in the epidemic of rage against that notable and powerful, successful way of saving the lives of people from the dangers of the smallpox. This is, in fact, I would argue, the beginning of the traditional way of looking at those who are concerned historically about immunization, is that they were, in fact, dangerous and so deluded that in this case, using his own ideas at the time, were literally satanic. He did not mean that as a metaphor. He meant that quite literally. And we have taken those ideas and secularized them in order to argue 
that current or any mo uh, any time during history that people have been opposed to vaccines, that they are in fact utterly deluded. This continues among historians today very directly. A recent book on Boston argues that inoculations opponents were simply the poor and frightened and uneducated crowd whom you could expect nothing else of. A biographer of Ben Franklin himself wrote about James Franklin, the brother who supported the anti-inoculationists, uh, that unfortunately they were on the wrong side of history. Now I'm going to argue that that's incorrect. That first, we should not be categorizing people as being on the wrong side of history unless we're very, very careful about it and arguably limit that kind of judgment to say people like Hitler, not these folks. So why would I be saying that? Because we now do recognize that inoculation was a step in medical progress. It did save lives. The people who were inoculated died of smallpox at a rate roughly one-seventh of those who got the smallpox naturally. So there's a reason, looking back from the present, that we would condemn those who oppose this great progress. However, again, we need to use our historical temperament carefully here. For one thing, this was the first time inoculation had been introduced into the Americas on any kind of mass basis, and literally people did not know how it would turn out. Also, and perhaps most importantly, inoculation was dangerous. You could die from it. Jonathan Edwards, who's now most famous, I think, for being the grandfather of Aaron Burr, died from inoculation. Furthermore, if you were not sequestered and quarantined after getting inoculated, you could spread smallpox. And in Boston in 1721, Boylston and Mather did not advocate for such quarantining, and therefore, we don't know how many, but opened up the city to even more smallpox infection in that way. And modern historians have recognized that very overtly. John Blake is a very mainstream medical historian, or he was, and Blake said that Mather and Boylston cannot escape censure for their neglect of the rights of the community by their failure to take any steps to prevent those who are inoculated from transmitting the disease to others. What's my main point here? Is that there are plenty more than one side to thinking about who was right or who was wrong, or even if that is the correct way of thinking, the right question to ask, who was right or who was wrong. In any case, the conflict got so intense that there was actually an assassination attempt against Cotton Mather. Someone threw a bomb into his bedroom window. It happened that somebody, a nephew of his was there, recovering from an inoculation actually, and the bomb failed to go off. And there was a note attached to it which said, Cotton Mather, you dog, damn you. I'll, inocu I'll inoculate you with this, with a pox to you. That is literally how heated the conflict was in Boston. Another complexity here relates to Mather's main antagonist, William Douglas. William Douglas was the only officially certified, educated medical doctor in the colonies at this point. Born in Scotland, he was educated in Europe and was very proud of having a medical degree. Other people practiced medicine, of course, Boylston and many of the ministers did to some extent. Douglas was the doctor. And Douglas opposed inoculation. This is very strange. 
why would the most modern scientific doctor in Boston oppose inoculation? And again, Douglas was concerned about a variety of issues. In particular, though, he was very, very upset that Boylston allowed those who were inoculated to walk around town and potentially infect people. Douglas himself was part of an incredibly vicious war of pamphlets. I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of that. That if we think of today's rhetoric related to vaccine controversies as very polarized and difficult, it was nothing compared to what was happening in 1721. Just a few quotations here. Uh, the uh, anti-vaccination, or excuse me, anti-inoculationists characterized Cotton Mather as a peevish mongrel, a dunghill cock, and a baboon who reckons himself a species superior to poor ordinary monkeys. Each side accused each other of murder. Each side accused each other of being atheistical, blasphemous, and treasonable. And uh, excuse me, I'm going to have to just cut a little bit here. Um, but the point was is that both sides were so vicious to each other rhetorically as well as politically that someone wrote, a new scene of contention has caused an alarm of war to ring from every quarter in Boston. So the final character I want to introduce is Ben Franklin's brother. For reasons of time, I'll be short here and say that James Franklin was a very important figure in the development of the free and democratic press in the colonies and in American history generally. And he began his career with the New England Current. The reason the New England Current was founded was as an organ for the anti-inoculationists. So there's more to this story, but if, again, you want to think of those who were opposed to the modern miracle of inoculation as uh, terrible people who were opposed to democracy, you would have a very hard time arguing that when you have people like William Douglas and James Franklin involved. Andy, I want to say a little bit more at the end in transition, but I will stop there and see if there are any other questions. Sure. Uh, just a, a, a couple of questions, Professor. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the ways that vaccines were tested and or medically sound back in this particular era? You know, you hear a lot today about about the research studies and about the, the ways that vaccines are approved. Was there any of that mechanism in the 19th century Amer or 18th century U.S.? Hmm. Not in 1721. And in fact, William Douglas uh, use that as a reason against the introduction of inoculation at that point, because he said that the only responsible way to introduce a novel medical intervention would be to have some kind of systematic test, whereas uh, Bather and Boylston had simply read pamphlets from Europe and learned, for good reason, that it, inoculation could be helpful and just started it in what Douglas thought was a willy-nilly way. Now, as we go on into the later 18th century, there were no systematic government regulations related or testing of inoculation. There was, however, increasing statistical analysis of it to see what kind of dangers it presented. It killed roughly one and a half to two percent of the people who took it, but if then it did have the life-saving properties that I indicated earlier. And in that way, it was tested in a very mass statistical method. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, one more question before we move on. Um, you talked a little bit about the disinformation, uh, the use of pamphlets, and even the press. H how were most of the either pro or anti-vaccine sentiment shared? Was it word of mouth? Was it through the pulpit? Was it um, regional, uh, or was it really through this this print uh, the the print printed word mechanism? Excellent question. So we can't tell so well because people did not leave systematic accounts or diaries of how they learned about these things, unfortunately. And what we do have is this incredible 
set of pamphlets and newspapers. And so we're, we would, we're biased toward what sources we have and thinking that that was the chief medium for the conflict. However, the fact that not only Mather, but most of the official minister, mainstream establishment ministers in town were very pro-inoculation. We know that this was being discussed in churches. Uh, there seems to be some sense that Anglicans were more opposed at that point to inoculation, in part because of the tension between Anglicans and Puritans. So it clearly must have been happening in taverns, in churches, on the streets, but what we do know is the media. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one last question, actually. This comes from Mary. Mary's joining us from Connecticut tonight. And she's wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, the one case that probably many of our participants and educators do share with their students, that is George Washington's decision to inoculate his troops during the American Revolution. Can you speak to that, uh, to that moment a little bit? Yes, certainly. And uh, let me put the name of a historian who is fantastic on Twitter and is writing a book about these things that's coming out, I think, early next year. And I would highly recommend for those of you who follow Twitter, which I don't much, uh, to get onto his account because he's writing all kinds of great uh, stuff about the connection between past and present. And he, Andrew Wehrman, is arguing that, in fact, uh, not only did Washington have this policy, but there was a grassroots call for it from soldiers who were very concerned about smallpox and very much wanted to have access to inoculation and approved of mandatory inoculation for their fellow soldiers. At the same time, Wehrman and other people argue that there was a continuous resistance, especially among urban artisans and more working class people in cities, to inoculation, especially in the years leading up to the actual Revolutionary War, and that the people who were most opposed to British rule and formulated a policy of liberty and we might say democracy were the ones who were most suspicious of inoculation. Fantastic, uh, Professor, thank you. Why don't we go ahead and move forward into the progressive era and we'll ask some more questions momentarily. Awesome, okay, I'm just gonna take a moment and take a breath and let people put in the chat who those three people are, if anybody knows who, uh, who, that's I, got, a, who I got up on the screen. That's a sneaky uh, history teacher move, Professor, um, <laughs> and he does not meet it in a hypothetical. Please <laughs> add to the audience chat uh, in order, one, two, three, from hmm. left to right. Who are these, the people in these three images? Now, Professor, we have to give them just a moment to uh, stretch their fingers, <laughs> to get to their audience chat keyboard. Yeah. I, I am known for cultivating and being willing to nurture. Uh, we're not at stock yet, sorry, but um, we're uh, in the early 20th century. But yeah, for cultivating silences, but I know this isn't the proper mode. <laughs> for that. It's hard to be a disc jockey and have your uh, your kind of go dark. I'll tell you. Um, yeah. Sorry, well, Charles. Um, so it's not Salk. So who are these? Who are the three people in this yeah. image? One, two, three, yeah, please. Yeah, Salk is coming. I'll give you a ten seconds here, guys. No, it's not Olivia Carvel <laughs> from LA. All right. <laughs> nice yeah. try, Olivia. I, I, I was intending to. I was thinking, yeah, Olivia. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, so the dower guy on the left. Well, I, I have personal oh. connections to all these people, so I'll say it's one of the reasons I put them in here. They, Rockefeller, Curry. Uh, uh, actually, Rockefeller, Jane Adams. Adams. And uh, my favorite is William Uren. I'll put that in as well, and who should be uh, um, known as well known as some of the other people. But yes, um, I'll explain him in a moment. The connections I have is John D. Rockefeller, the great capitalist titan so-called robber baron. Uh, actually, his first business partner was my great-great-grandfather, whom he drove out of business. And Jane Addams, the great social reformer, suffragist, uh, political theorist, uh, and founder of Hull House, which is on my campus at UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago, so that's the connection I have here. And then also William Uren was the founder of Direct Democracy, the initiative and referendum in America, and he came from Oregon. 
and in fact was involved in vaccine controversies just a bit. So we'll get to him. So anyway, so I, I, we're jumping 200 years into the uh, future from where we were before. I just wanted to reorient you a little bit there to some of the main characters of the progressive era. All right, and now uh, I got a couple difficult slides. When I published my first book on these issues, my editor said you can have two icky pictures in the book and no more. Uh, but people who read it say that they remember those icky pictures very well. So look, when we're talking about smallpox, which is what we were in Boston, what we're still talking about in the early 20th century, it was a horrific disease, one of the dread diseases of humanity. It killed and it killed throughout the globe millions of people. That said, what's intriguing medically about the early 20th century conflicts is that there were two strains of smallpox going around. Variola major, which was what this person had, huge pu uh, pustules, often they were much worse, closed people's eyes, created great pussy confluences. I won't go on anymore. You can kind of imagine that. That was variola major, the predominant uh, strain of smallpox throughout history. However, for reasons we still don't know, variola minor was predominant in the very late 19th century and early 20th century. And this is really important to know because of how people made decisions about whether to get smallpox vaccines or to fight government mandates of them. People often saw that smallpox was nothing much more than chickenpox, and they weren't wrong about that. Variola minor, you could barely tell it was different from chickenpox. It had a greatly reduced mortality rate. And so when people thought of smallpox then, it wasn't this guy or even worse. It was actually just people walking down the street with an illness, which was, of course, very common during that time. In turn, here's what they saw, and I apologize, this is not a great picture, um, but you can get enough sense of this. This is a reaction to a smallpox vaccine. Right? This came from the vaccine itself. This is not conspiratorial, a conspiratorial source. This is a mainstream uh, medical source that has this photograph because, indeed, at this point, smallpox vaccination was relatively crude. It got uh, better and more regulated as the early 20th century wore on, but still it had all kinds of viruses in it that could cause, as well as the smallpox virus, it could even transmit syphilis in ways that I don't have time to explain. And this is what people would see, that you could take your chances on getting variola minor, a, a very mild strain of smallpox, or you could risk submitting your baby to this kind of disfigurement. Many things came into play in explaining the mass resistance to smallpox vaccination in the early 20th century, but this is really kind of the stage that we need to set first. And resistance there was. The progressive era is often known for being a very modern era, perhaps the first modern era in American history. It's very, it's where science, expertise, modern medicine came into play, professionalism, public health. All of these, historians argue, were born during the early 20th century. Yet, there were plenty of people who resisted vaccination and most importantly, mandatory vaccination throughout this time. And I don't know if you can see very well on the right. <coughs> uh, it's actually from Toronto, so I'm cheating a little bit, and I apologize for any Canadians. I'm not trying to make an imperial move and try to bring Canada into the United States, but there was a wider North American resistance to mandatory vaccines. And the sign in the right-hand photo, the right-hand sign says compulsory vaccination German-born, down with compulsion. There was a sense that American liberties were being violated. And you can see the size of this crowd. Vaccine resistance was large enough during this period that only nine states had mandatory vaccination laws, even though public health authorities were desperate 
to get them on the books. Now, why was that? The picture on the left speaks just a little bit to this. What we get here is a working class man being vaccinated kind of in a crowd. It looks probably like he's submitting to it, but not necessarily very happy to it, but many of us don't uh, get too happy when we get our shots. And what he's risking, however, is with this vaccination, and we might find this familiar with COVID, is at least a day, if not two weeks off of work because he has such a problem with a swollen and painful arm that he can't go back to his industrial job. That's just one reason for resistance during this period. Another reason is that during this age of mass immigration, people came to America for many reasons, but one of them was to escape tyrannical state authorities, and especially immigrants <coughs> who had done so feared that government-mandated vaccination was in fact happening again and that they would be suffering from it. Resistance was so strong in the early 20th century that the most influential medical public health official of the period, Charles Chapin, picture of Charles Chapin, oops, no, not Charles Chapin, see I had somebody else up there on the screen, uh, this is Charles Chapin, wrote in 1913 that the United States was the least vaccinated of any civilized country. Uh, actually, I did, I'm not looking too much at the chat, I apologize, but I saw Mary's question about unions. And I would say, if anything, unions were, in ways similar today, perhaps, were skeptical uh, of vaccines. So, but it wasn't necessarily a central issue for them. Okay. And I say that, that button uh, on my picture, that's, I'm the chief steward for UIC United Faculty. I'll just throw that in there as well. Okay, so there were medical reasons for opposing vaccines. There were just concerns about personal health. There were also concerns about uh, abuse of police power because working class and black people, as I said earlier, Mexicans on the border got beat up. This is especially well told in Will Rich's book. Also, vaccine resistance was, oh no. Um, did I just uh, lose power for a moment? Are, are we, are people- No, Andy? no, we're oh. still here, yeah. Okay, sorry, something happened on the computer. All right, back to the action. Uh, there was a massive, excuse me, a very dedicated set of anti-vaccination activists who made sure that opposition to both vaccines itself, themselves and mandatory vaccinations were always on the political radar of ordinary Americans during this period. And Laura Little was the most important anti-vaccinationist of this early period. You've probably never heard of her. She's actually in one textbook now, uh, but there would have been no reason to know of her because people did not care about these kinds of issues until relatively recently. However, she's a fascinating figure, and the reason I know about her is because I uh, wrote my first book about progressive era populism in Portland, Oregon during the early 20th century and found that Laura Little was involved in all kinds of movements. She herself had lost her son, Kenneth, to what she considered a botched smallpox vaccine and from that moment fought for rights again, uh, to uh, not have people vaccinated and also to live a healthy alternative lifestyle, natural healing, good diet, staying away from sugar and white rice, to only eat whole wheat flour. Some of the things that you hear about today were very much uh, from this period, and in fact, went well back into the 19th century. Laura Little, who edited various journals, but one called The Liberator, very much following the tradition of William Lloyd Garrison, uh, was somebody who felt very, very strongly that you could not have a genuine democracy and liberty without having freedom, medical freedom. What did Laura Little do? This is not a great picture. What it represents is the voters pamphlet that the state of Oregon sent out when there was a special election in 1913 against, uh, to vote on whether or not the state should adopt 
eugenic sterilization. What does that mean? This happened in many, in, throughout the country, and 30 states adopted these horrible, terrible, draconian sterilization laws that permitted various kinds of people to be sterilized against their will. Imbeciles, as we'll see, was a main word used at the time. Morons, incredibly disrespectful and offensive words, obviously. Feeble-minded, these were the categories that were used at the same time that a much wider variety of populations were uh, targeted, especially people of color, immigrants, and working class people who had perhaps committed a crime or not, but were charged with it. Oh, good, and Wendy Klein, excellent. What a great uh, scholar of eugenics. In Oregon, Bethenia Owens Adair was a very, very progressive person. There was no doubt about that. She was one of the leading women suffragists in the state. She was a temperance advocate in all kinds of ways. She advocated for labor reform, things that we would generally approve of. And like so many progressives, she wanted to improve the human race. How did you improve the human race? You, know, you could do it through eight-hour laws, or you could keep the unclean, bad people from reproducing. And so Owens Adair pushed the Oregon legislature hard enough to get the legislature in 1913 to pass a law to, st uh, to sterilize thrice-convicted thrice felons, morons, imbeciles, and the like. The legislature passed that. It seemed completely uncontroversial until Laura Little got involved. And this is key. There was only one time in American history that eugenic sterilization was put to a popular vote because of the direct democracy mechanisms, the initiative and referendum that Oregon and especially other Western states had at the time. One time in American history, we can actually see what the people would do when it came time to support eugenic sterilization. Laura Little decided that the 1913 Oregon Eugenic Sterilization Law was the most barbaric measure ever passed by any legislature. And she was determined to get it before the voters and to do all she could to get it overturned via the referendum. And in this, she had the support of this person on the right, William Uren, the chief direct Democrat in Oregon, who was very much supportive of her. So, sorry to make people's heads spin. But what happened? In Oregon, the populace, the people, overturned compulsory sterilization. And the only time that happened in American history. How did it happen? Because anti-vaccinationists, and especially the primary anti-vaccinationists in America, Laura Little decided to fight for what we now know was the right way to conceive of liberty. It was the public health officials who supported, generally, sterilization. It was the anti-vaccinationists who opposed sterilization. We should, again, think before we condemn. And we should especially think before we condemn because there was a very direct connection between vaccination and sterilization. The infamous Supreme Court decision that upheld eugenic sterilization was Buck versus Bell in 1927. And in that case, there were real people involved. In this case, on the left is Carrie Buck, who was the person who put the case forward because she had been forcibly sterilized, supposedly because she was of abnormal intelligence. For what it matters, it seems that that was completely made up, but even more because she was dangerous, lewd, promiscuous, had had an unwanted pe pregnancy, which was caused actually by uh, a cousin who raped her, this kind of thing. And she was sterilized by the state of Virginia. This is her mother, Emma, as well. So real people, in Oregon there were 2,500 people sterilized by the state. 
2,500, and of course tens of thousands throughout the United States. The Supreme Court took on this case and tried to figure out whether or not eugenic sterilization was a proper use of state power. And Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes is often considered a, a true hero, a Civil War patriot, a uh, great jurist, a real defender of liberty and democracy in other realms. In this case, however, he crafted one of the most infamous decisions in American history, the majority decision in Buck versus Bell. And here you've got the quotation that is most well known uh, from the case. And that is enough. I want you to look at it very carefully. This is the U.S. Supreme Court speaking. And while you're looking at that, I actually want to read the paragraph that ends with that. Holmes wrote, We have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices, often not felt to be such by those concerned, in order to, to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Andy, I'm going to take a break here again. Okay, thank you. Um, again, please to all of our uh, audience members, our participants, drop any kind of formal questions you have in the chat box. Uh, I've got a couple that have queued up, and um, while folks are considering their questions, Professor, I also want to remind uh, our audience that we we were joined by Wendy Klein just a few weeks ago, who uh, did a pretty in-depth. Uh, webinar on eugenics and uh, the sterilization policies of the early 20th century. I'd encourage all of you to take a look at the resources there and the associated recordings. Um, this question, Professor, is a little bit, uh, this could be a question that you either have or will continue to answer, but at least I'm going to put it on the table for you. And this comes from Charles. Charles is joining us from Tidewater, Virginia. Uh, he asks if you can speak to any historical accounts of local, state, or federal governmental action against vaccines, almost as a precursor to what Governor Abbott in Texas is doing uh, right now. Uh, yes, perhaps not uh, a direct parallel to what is happening in Texas, but there were you know, legislatures in plenty of states besides Oregon considered whether or not to have mandatory vaccination. People, there were plenty of interests that wanted to have mandatory vaccination. And sometimes they won. There were nine states that had general mandatory vaccination laws, especially related to school attendance. But actually, during the early 20th century, it rarely got that far. Uh, there were four states that actually prohibited in their constitutions mandatory vaccination. And Otherwise, there were strong enough social forces. There were Laura Littles and mass resistance in other states as well that it never got far enough for the governor to say, try to undercut either a state or a federal policy. Great, thank you. Um, I'll tell you what, we, one of my unfortunate roles as the moderator is to keep an eye on the clock. We've got about 15 to 20 minutes um, I'm going to give you one last question, and then let's move forward with the conclusion of your presentation, and then we can talk a little bit at the end. Uh, this last and segue question comes from Alice. Alice is joining us from Monterey Vista Elementary School, and she's wondering if the Spanish flu of 1918 had conflicts around vaccination policies. Actually, not so much vaccine-related, because there was not a known influenza vaccination at that part time, but yes, relating to masks, very much relating to masks. There was an anti-mask league in San Francisco. William Uren himself said that uh, dictating the wearing of masks was like being in Russia, this kind of thing. So that's the most direct parallel. 
Great, thank you. Um, well, let's go ahead and, and, and finish your presentation and then we'll take some questions at the conclusion. Awesome, and with apologies, I'm gonna kind of slide quickly through the last section here. So the main point of this section on the Cold War, and I hope a uh, number of you have seen the great movie, Dr. Strangelove. If you haven't, uh, please, please do. It's a, a gift to you and your students about uh, the Cold War mentality. And in this case, this is the actor Sterling Hayden as, the gen as General Jack D. Ripper, who was a very ardent anti-fluoridationist and was very concerned about communist infiltration of our bodily fluids. And this, of course, is humorous, but at the same time, it, is, it dictates one direction in which anti-vaccination activism went during the course of the 20th century. So the main point, I've been in many ways asking us to rethink our previous vision of vaccine dissidents as perhaps democratic, as oriented toward liberty and democracy. Yet, also, if you're looking at those January 6th insurrectionists, and the connections they do have with anti-vaccination movements, you will see that developing during the Cold War era. Again, I have some good stuff about Dewan Miller. Uh, he was a Florida man who was very ardent, opponent of polio vaccination, advocate of natural healing and the like, and also engaged in a number of illegal and fraudulent uh, kind of medical device activities, was pr prosecuted by the Federal Trade Commission. Another time I will tell Dewan Miller's story. But vaccine, uh, opposition to polio vaccine was not marginal. And I think that's important to know because the story we hear generally about polio, and it's not untrue, is that the polio vaccine was an utter godsend and that Americans flocked to it uh, like it was kind of a sacrament, because it indeed prevented such uh, harm to their children and to their fellow citizens. And so we don't know that, in fact, there was considerable resistance to the introduction of the vaccine, and even after it was relatively well established. A Red Book article in 1956 wrote, a great many mothers are turning against the polio serum due to acts anti-vaccine leaflets. The head of the Better, Better Business Bureau wrote, our inquiries show conclusively that the opposition to the Salk vaccine is a serious problem. We shall be missing the point entirely if we discount this opposition as that of a lunatic fringe. Now, there were plenty of reasons that ordinary mothers or parents would oppose or be concerned about polio vaccines. It's similar to what you read about today. But here I do want to actually focus somewhat on the uh, lunatic fringe, a uh, term that here might actually work. So when I title, in a kind of challenging way, the slide, Salk, Saban, and the Jews, it's because anti-Semitism was a major facet of anti-vaccination, really beginning in the 1950s. And it came out of uh, very, very strong anti-communist political activism. So a couple quotations. Uh, the March of Dimes drives every year seem to be run in almost every community and on the higher levels by left-wing Jews and known New Dealers and do-gooders. It is thoroughly, they are thoroughly of an alien character. Uh, Robert Williams, a spokesperson for this Brain called the Anti-Defamation League part of the World Communist Offensive. Uh, interestingly said that Jews were planning to uh, convert everyone to Christianity better to better promote a racial movement and a social revolution. And Lyrell von Heining wrote that Jews are trying to mass poison American children. And of course, uh, she knew what this was all about because the Jews had poisoned President Eisenhower, killed him, and brought in somebody who supposedly was President Eisenhower in his place whom the Jews could control. So this is fascism and fascist ideology. And part of the reading that I gave you, 
from, if again, for those of you who have or will look at the extra readings, come from people like R. Swinburne Clymer, who very much argued that vaccinationists were trying to dilute the strength of the Aryan master race. So, not all vaccine dissidents were good folks. I have no problem judging them in that regard. And we need to recognize the complexity, again, but also a complexity that doesn't ignore genuine, dangerous, anti-democratic, and indeed fascist strains. One interesting thing is that much we can find much information from kind of a secret police file, is what I call it. The American Medical Association, starting in 1906, spied on anti-vaccinationists, natural healers, chiropractors, and the like, and wrote up these incredible reports for historians. And uh, researchers can go and look into what was going on. And this is how I know a fair amount about these, uh, these dangerous kind of folks. They were dangerous, even if the AMA arguably was violating uh, civil liberties while they were spying on them. All right. Let me just conclude, and then we'll have some time for some discussion, which I would very much again welcome. As I've indicated, it's really important to rep recognize that throughout the 300 years of vaccine and immunization controversies, there were huge complexities, huge varieties, huge differences among those who were opposed to or concerned about vaccines. We don't do ourselves any good to lump them into one category. At the same time, there was significant continuity. There was plenty of change, but there was also continuity because similar concerns related to liberty, freedom, and medical innovation were often at play. But those who argue that the past directly mirrored the present, I think, are on the wrong side here. In particular, democracy and populism, the idea that the elites, the experts, the people in charge should not be in charge, that there should be a wider uh, way of having a radical mass democracy was often at play in modern vaccine movements. And we need to not discount that populism could be very, very democratic, and it can also have very dangerous tendencies as we've seen in our current era. So in the end, how do we actually figure out how to think about the connections between past and present in a way that allows us to talk to each other with our own different views about the COVID vaccine and COVID vaccine policies? And here, I forgot to put the actual citations into the slide, but I'll put them into the chat in uh, a moment. Uh, but there are some very smart commentators who are arguing, again, in, from a very pro-vaccine standpoint, that condemnation of our fellow citizens because we disagree with them and, in fact, feel like they're supporting dangerous, if not deadly, policies is something that doesn't help. That if we just refuse to talk to those who we're bitterly opposed to, and if we're simply condemning them, that all we're doing is feeling virtuous, not making any progress in our shared goals, and also ignoring the structural inequalities related to our health system that kill many more people than uh, problems related to the COVID vaccine. These are the very challenging perspectives of Sarah Smarsh and Bryce Covert, and again, I'll put their New York Times op-eds into the chat in a moment. But actually, I want to end with Daniel Neal. He looks a little bit different from everybody, I think, correct? I'm going to take that as assent, uh, even though silence is never assent. Uh, Daniel <laughs> Neal was, um, as you might imagine from his picture, an avidly pro-inoculationist minister in Boston in 1721. And at the same time when Cotton Mather was calling his opponent Satan, 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 couldn't do much more name calling than that. Douglas, or excuse me, Neil said, hey, actually, I think we should try to humanize these anti inoculationists. He wrote, 
And again, this is 1721. Recognize kind of how this speaks to us. Wrote, for my own part, I am far from wondering at the opposition of the common people of Boston against a practice so new and of such an extraordinary nature. Some, no doubt, were acted by others from behind the scenes. Others had conscientious scruples in their minds, and a great many opposed it out of a regard to the public good, being apprehensive of the consequences of spreading an infection, which ought rather to have been stifled. And I must confess, confess this objection has its weight with me, for it is certain that the smallpox is as infectious in the inoculated as in those who have it in the ordinary way. And what can we make of that? I would say that we might do very well to emulate Neil's understanding, respect, sympathy, and humanity, along with his willingness to genuinely engage those who strongly differed in their sentiments as we participate in our own bitter debates about vaccination today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. It's a, it's a lovely way to, uh, to respond as a humanist and as an educator. Well, we've got a couple of questions that I'd like to bring to you before we conclude for the evening. Uh, the first question comes from Monica in nearby Durham, North Carolina. She's wondering if you can talk a little bit about the role in um, in any part of the layers that you've been talking about, but the role of big pharmaceutical companies and industry. Where does big pharma uh, play as a character in the story that you've told us? That's not my cat, I don't think. Uh, no, that's my cat. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, I love that's it. That's Skinny Pete. Sorry, he's getting up here. He's, he, he wants I, to be involved. I love it. Um, so uh, I've got a couple who usually are involved, but uh, I close the door this time. So excellent question. And as you can imagine, especially you see this in Elena Konis's book, Vaccine Nation, I referenced earlier, that the critique of kind of Ralph Naderites, environmentalists and the like, uh, was very much related to the power uh, of pharmaceutical companies, both economically as monopolies and in terms of their power, in terms of over-government regulation, essentially capturing the government. So Big Pharma was a major target of vaccine skeptics uh, starting really in the 60s and 70s and certainly is very much the case today. And at the same time, it was also very much talked about in the early 20th century. There were not as recognizable big corporations doing pharmaceuticals at that time, but there were distinctive and powerful economic entities, and Laura Little and her fellow anti-vaccinationists were all over that. Mm, thank you. This question comes from Bethany. Bethany's in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, Professor, can you uh, share if there's any sort of uh, pattern or alignment on the on the stance around inoculation and vaccine by political party has it traditionally been a democratic or a republican uh, thing or is it just sort of respond to the context of the moment great question again uh, and i'm not just saying that as a, a ritual so again part of the reading packet that you'll uh, have available to you if you haven't had a chance to look at is i think a really smart new york times article about connecting past and present in vaccine controversies from Maggie Astor. And one scholar there, I can't remember who actually, noted that there is something actually very new in this era, literally the last few years. And that is where vaccine dissidents have become so politically polarized. There are certainly plenty of people still on the left, the kind of green, naderite, feminist kind of folks who are concerned about corporate anti-feminist medicine, that kind of thing. That, that continues. But the way that anti-vaccine dissidence has largely centered uh, among uh, the conservative right now, and especially in the Republican Party, that's new. We can, can note that as clearly a change, because before vaccine dissidents could cover really, uh, could really bridge political ideology. Great, thank you. Um, Professor, our next question comes from Vince in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Vince is wondering if, even though you're, I think, a professor of uh, 
largely uh, American history and the and the U.S. perspective. Can you talk at all about the uh, sort of the global reaction to vaccines? Uh, how do other countries respond to these same kinds of questions and trends? Hmm. So that's uh, something that I need to know more about. I'm beginning to learn about it. I'm actually fortunate enough to be going to give a version of this talk uh, next week in several universities in Switzerland. And you know, the Swiss are known as nice, peaceful people, but in fact, there's been significant uh, rioting and smashing of things there related to COVID mandates. So I have a sense, and, and from what I understand, it's also very much related to both kind of green-oriented folks, a combination, and uh, right-wing anti-immigrant political parties. Mm -hmm. So, and I've heard that's happening in India. However, that's really kind of the extent of my knowledge, other than mm -hmm. to think that there must be some connection to the general rise of often reactionary populism throughout the globe and these kinds of issues. Right. Thank you. Two more questions uh, for our session tonight. The, the next one comes from Rebecca. She's joining us from Los Angeles Unified in Southern California. Um, her question and then I'll contextualize her question. She asks, are there statistics kept on mortality rates due to vaccinations? And if so, why are they not more widely published or publicized? Yeah. And she's asking because recently in the last couple of weeks, she's heard uh, several people who say on separate occasions that they know people who died from the vaccinations, but she's concerned that this argument isn't being countered. Mm. Uh, so one moment, I'm just looking up something here. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm going to put it in the chat, and that is uh, there is an official federal vaccine compensation program for uh, adverse effects. Now, it's hugely controversial. It was actually the result of a compromise in the 1980s between vaccine dissidents uh, through what's now called the National Vaccine Information Center and the pharmaceutical companies to try to limit risk. And... It's who gets to decide what a risk is that's really critical. Uh, but insofar as we have an official body that tries to adjudicate these issues, it is that vaccine. So it's what's called the vaccine court. And so that does a fair amount of the work with that in connection with the CDC. Uh, in terms of actual COVID deaths and the like, I do not know whether or not uh, there are any official statistics or ones that would be reputable by any means. I, that's out of my element, I'm afraid. Great. Thank you. Here uh, is the last question. This comes from Kate. Kate's joining us from um, uh, Pittsway, uh, Michigan. And Kate is wondering, I'm going to ask you to put on your director of the, the, the history teaching program now. Um, getting back to historiography, how do you address teacher bias and point of view when curating resources and reading for students? How, how, how do you address that teacher bias? All right. Uh, so I don't want to be rude, but I will actually uh, challenge the word bias. And I do this mm -hmm. uh, actually with the permission of a really wonderful high school teacher who's written some great work about the teaching of history named Bruce Lesh. Uh, he's published a fantastic book called Why Don't You Just Tell Me the Answer or Tell Us the Answer. And he argues there that, in fact, you really do need to include all kinds of historical inquiry methods in the classroom in order to get students to do good history, and they don't necessarily want to do that. And so, uh, I'm sorry, Andy, could you just rephrase the question because I missed the connection there, but I'm, I know what it is. <laughs> yeah, certainly. It's, it's just how, um, either in your own training or how do we all keep in mind um, how Perfect. to either either acknowledge or or work around bias in the curation right. of historiographic. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So yeah, so Lesh really recommends we change bias to perspective, that all sources, primary and secondary, of course have perspectives because we're human beings. And part of the delight and part of the difficulty of exploring those historical sources is not to say, well, na 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 na, that's bias, but in fact to recognize it's a perspective one among many. Some can be completely false. Others can be resonant to different kinds of people in different kinds of ways, and that we need to interrogate that. And that's one of our largest uh, talents and obligations as history teachers is to help 
students then transition to life recognizing that everything they get from the internet on down is going to be full of perspectives. Uh, Professor Robert Johnson, thank you so much for joining us tonight for narrating the story for us and being available for the questions. Uh, thanks so much. It was my pleasure, Andy and everybody. Thank you so much. And if anybody would like to contact me, please do not hesitate to reach out. I'd be really delighted to be in touch. And I'll just drop my email address in the, in the chat. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, all of our audience for joining us for tonight's episode. Uh, please do pay attention to our, our emails and upcoming announcements that we issue from the Center for future events. That does include our next webinar, which is one to two nights from now. October 14th, I'll be joined by Marcia Chatelaine from Georgetown University. She'll be uh, leading a talk on the Great Migration, Different Perspectives. Have a great day at school tomorrow. Um, we hope that you join us for a future webinar. We'll see you next time, everybody.